Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. My husband and I had gone through all the tests, tried every natural method to have a baby, and finally decided to seek help from a fertility specialist. It was a big step for us, especially considering how expensive fertility treatments can be in the United States. But we were ready to start our family no matter what it took. When the doctor prescribed fertility medication, I felt a glimmer of hope. This could be it, I thought. The key to finally becoming a mother. I went to pick up my prescription from the local pharmacy, excited to start this new chapter in our lives. The first day I took the medication, I felt awful. I was nauseous, dizzy, and could barely keep my eyes open. I thought maybe I hadn't eaten enough breakfast, so I tried to push through it. But by lunchtime, I was vomiting in the office bathroom. I told my boss I wasn't feeling well and needed to go home. My boss asked if I was sure, reminding me about the big meeting that afternoon. I apologized, but explained that I really couldn't stay as I could barely stand up. I went home and slept for hours. The next day, thinking it was just a one-off reaction, I took another dose. The same thing happened, only worse. I felt like my brain was wrapped in cotton. That's when I knew something was seriously wrong. At my next appointment with a fertility specialist, I mentioned what had happened. The doctor said that wasn't a normal reaction to the medication he had prescribed and checked my file. After a few minutes of looking through my records and making some calls, the doctor's face turned pale. He apologized and informed me that the pharmacy had given me the wrong medication. He explained that I had been taking an antipsychotic drug instead of my fertility medication. I was shocked and asked how that was possible. The doctor told me he had already contacted the pharmacy to inform them of their mistake. Given the high dosage I took, he strongly recommended I go to the emergency room for testing. I was in shock. How could this happen? I trusted these people with my health, and they gave me the wrong medication. I went to the emergency room as advised where they ran a series of tests. Two days later, I was back again with chest pains and a rapid heartbeat. The bills started piling up. Two emergency room visits, countless tests, lost work days. It all added up to about $30,000. I was furious. This wasn't my fault, yet I was the one suffering the consequences. When the pharmacy company gave me a claim number to call for a settlement, I didn't know what to expect. I'd never dealt with anything like this before. I called a few attorneys for advice, and they all said the same thing. Try to settle it yourself first. So, I steeled myself and made the call. A representative from the pharmacy answered. They said they understood there was an unfortunate mix-up with my prescription and offered a settlement to cover my medical expenses. I told them I appreciated that, but explained that I needed more than just my medical expenses covered. I pointed out that this mistake could have seriously harmed me, that I had to miss work, and that I was still dealing with the emotional impact of what happened. The representative then offered $20,000 to cover my out-of-pocket expenses. I refused, explaining that my emergency room bills alone were $30,000, not including my lost wages or the initial copay for the wrong medication they gave me. I also mentioned that I was asking for compensation for pain and suffering. When the representative hesitated, I made myself clear. I told them they had made a dangerous mistake that put my health at risk. I explained that I was willing to settle this without involving lawyers, but only if they covered all my expenses related to their error and provided fair compensation for what I'd been through. I warned that if they couldn't do that, I'd have no choice but to file a formal complaint and pursue legal action. There was a long pause on the other end of the line. The representative then said they'd need to speak with their superiors and asked if they could call me back. I agreed but made it clear that I wasn't backing down on this and that their company needed to take responsibility for its actions. After a tense few days of back and forth negotiations, we finally reached an agreement. The pharmacy agreed to cover all my medical expenses, reimburse my lost wages, and provide additional compensation for the ordeal I've been through. They also implemented new safety protocols to prevent similar mistakes in the future.
When I got my first summer job at the local grocery store, I was 14, eager to earn some money. Everything was going fine until that day. I was restocking the cereal aisle when my phone buzzed in my pocket. Now, I know what you're thinking. I shouldn't have my phone out during work. But here's the thing. My mom was nine months pregnant and dad was out of town on a business trip. We had an agreement that if anything happened with the baby, she'd call me right away. So when I felt that buzz, I quickly pulled out my phone to check. It was just a text from a friend, but I figured I'd better reply quickly to let them know I was working. That's when I heard her voice. I looked up to see a woman glaring at me, hands on her hips. She looked like she was in her 40s. She demanded to know what I was doing, her tone accusatory and sharp. I apologized and explained that I was just checking a message, then offered to help her find something. But she wasn't interested in my help. Instead, she scolded me, saying I was supposed to be working, not playing on my phone. She threatened to report me to my manager. I tried to explain further, but she cut me off before I could finish. She wasn't interested in excuses and demanded that I give her my phone right away. Before I could react, she lunged forward and grabbed my wrist, trying to snatch my phone. I was shocked. Who does that to a kid they don't even know? I told her to let go of me, but she refused, insisting that she wouldn't until I handed over the phone. She even called me a lazy brat. Now, here's something you should know about me. I may be young, but I've been taking self-defense classes for years. My parents always said it was important to know how to protect myself. As she kept pulling at my arm, I reacted on instinct. I twisted my wrist, broke her grip, and then used her own momentum against her. With a quick move, I redirected her force, and suddenly she was stumbling backward. I didn't mean for it to happen, but she ended up crashing into the shelves behind her. Boxes of cereal went flying everywhere as she landed on her butt, looking stunned. She was furious and threatened to call the police. I calmly told her to go ahead, pointing out that they'd probably be interested to hear how she had assaulted a minor. That's when my manager rushed over, probably drawn by all the commotion. He asked what was going on, looking concerned and confused. Karen immediately started wailing, playing the victim. She accused me of attacking her and demanded that I be fired and arrested. I calmly explained what had happened, including why I had checked my phone in the first place. My manager, thankfully, was understanding. He addressed the woman, informing her about the security cameras that would show exactly what happened. He asked if she wanted him to call the police so they could review the footage. The woman's face went pale. I guess she realized her story wouldn't hold up. She tried to leave, declaring that she would never shop here again. But my manager stopped her. He told her that she needed to stay, explaining that assaulting a minor was a serious offense and that they would be reporting the incident. Long story short, the police did come. They reviewed the security footage, took statements from me, my manager, and some customers who had witnessed the whole thing. Karen was arrested for assault and attempted theft since she tried to take my phone. I didn't get in trouble at work. My manager was cool about the whole phone thing once I explained about my mom being pregnant. He even gave me a couple of days off to recover from the incident. The best part? My mom went into labor the very next day. So if I hadn't checked my phone when I did, I might have missed the birth of my baby sister. Talk about timing. After graduating with a degree in business administration, I was eager to start my career. But the job market was tough. When I saw an ad for an administrative assistant position at a small law firm, I figured it might be a good stepping stone. Little did I know what I was getting myself into. From day one, it was clear that my boss had a unique approach to running his business. He'd stroll in whenever he felt like it, often mid-afternoon, looking like he'd just rolled out of bed. He'd give me a nod, disappear into his office for an hour, then leave again. At first, I thought maybe he had important meetings or court appearances. Nope. Turns out he just didn't feel like working. As the weeks went by, I found myself juggling more and more responsibilities. Clients would call, frustrated that they couldn't reach their lawyer, and I'd have to make excuses. I'd tell them he was in a meeting and offered to take a message. They'd complain that I'd said the same thing yesterday and the day before, demanding to know when they could actually talk to him. I'd promise to make sure he called them back as soon as possible. But of course, 
he never did. Instead, he'd waltz in the next day with a tan and stories about his latest vacation. He'd casually ask if he missed anything important. I'd inform him about the several clients who called, mentioning their growing impatience about their cases. He'd brush it off, telling me to just inform the clients he was working hard on it and asking if I could handle that. Then he'd be off again, leaving me to deal with the mess. I started staying late trying to keep things from falling apart completely. I wasn't qualified to give legal advice, but I did my best to keep clients updated and organized. One day, my boss's friend, who happened to be my divorce attorney, stopped by the office. He'd been coming around more often, probably sensing something was off. He asked about my boss's whereabouts, and I made up an excuse about him being busy with cases. The friend called me out, pointing out that he hadn't seen my boss's car there in days. I hesitated, not wanting to badmouth my boss, but I was at my wit's end. I confessed my worries to the friend, explaining how my boss was hardly ever there, and when he was, he wasn't really working. I mentioned the angry clients and my suspicion that we were spending more than we were making. The friend agreed it didn't sound good and asked if my boss had done anything questionable. I spilled everything. The shady tactics, the ignored clients, the bounced checks. The friend listened, his frown deepening. He then suggested that his firm could use some extra help, but he didn't want to steal me away. He advised me to try talking to my boss first. I nodded, grateful for the potential lifeline. But before I could confront my boss, he burst into the office later that day, looking frazzled. He broke the news that we might have to shut down in the next few months and told me to start looking for a new job. I was stunned. After everything I'd done to keep this place afloat, he was just given up. The next day, I spoke to the friend again. He advised me to give my two weeks notice, saying it was the professional thing to do. I agreed, but before I could, my boss changed his tune again. He told me to hold off on the job search and give him a month to turn things around. But I'd had enough of his flip-flopping. I drafted my resignation and handed it to him at the end of the week. My boss was shocked at my resignation. He questioned why I was leaving and I reminded him of his own advice to find other employment. When he asked where I was going, I told him about his friend's law firm. He seemed taken aback, claiming he'd want me back once he made the business work. I wished him luck with that. He then asked about my new salary, and I admitted it was less than what he paid me, but pointed out that at least I knew the checks wouldn't bounce. A week after I left, I got a call from the guy they hired to replace me. He nervously told me that my old boss was freaking out, admitting he'd made a mistake in telling me to leave. Apparently, my former boss didn't know anything about his cases. Sucks to be him, I thought. Meanwhile, I was already thriving at my new job. Full-time hours, paid holidays, and a boss who actually showed up to work. Life was good. A month later, I heard through the grapevine that my former boss's firm had shut down for good. Apparently, without me there to keep things running, it all fell apart within weeks. Clients were furious, and there were even whispers of an investigation into some of his more questionable practices. Sometimes I think about my old job and shake my head. It's amazing how far a little work ethic can go. I've been working as a contractor for over a decade now, specializing in various construction and renovation projects. It's a job that's taken me all over the country, from bustling cities to remote towns you'd struggle to find on a map. I've always prided myself on being reliable, hardworking, and fair in my dealings. Little did I know that one day, these qualities would be put to the test. I landed a project in what I can only describe as the middle of nowhere. We're talking about a place where the nearest decent meal was a good hour's drive away. The project was for a county facility, and I was going to be there for a week. Now, being the kind of person who believes in building good relationships, I came up with an idea. I offered to bring breakfast tacos for the staff in exchange for free copy privileges. It seemed like a win-win situation to me. I called up the boss of the facility to run the idea by him. I explained my plan to bring breakfast tacos for the staff during my time there, and in exchange, I hoped to use the copy machine for free. I pointed out that the copy budget for the project was quite high, so I thought it was a fair trade. The boss responded enthusiastically, saying it sounded great and that the staff would appreciate it 
He added that it would save them some money on the copy budget and gave me the go-ahead. With his approval, I went ahead and bought two rounds of breakfast tacos for the week. It came out to just over $100, which I thought was a steal considering the copy budget was upwards of $1,000. Everyone was happy, the staff got their breakfast, and I got my copies done. It was smooth sailing, or so I thought. Fast forward to the end of the billing cycle. I submitted my receipts along with the supporting credit card statement, expecting it to be a simple process, but then I got the news my expense was declined. I was surprised but not angry. Mistakes happen, right? So, I decided to give the boss a call to remind him of our agreement. I called the boss and brought up the declined breakfast taco expense. I reminded him that he had approved it over the phone in exchange for copy privileges. The boss's response was curt and dismissive. He simply said that I should have gotten the agreement in writing. Those words hit me like a ton of bricks. I was floored. Here I was, trying to do something nice for the staff and save them money, and this is how I'm repaid. But to say I was pissed off would be an understatement. But being the professional I am, I swallowed my anger and finished the project as promised. Life went on, and I moved on to other projects for other clients. I thought I put that whole experience behind me until a couple of months later when I got an unexpected call. It was him, the boss who'd stiffed me on the taco money. The boss called to tell me about another project coming up at the start of the next month and asked if I was available. I was tempted to hang up right then and there, but curiosity got the better of me. We haggled over the details and eventually I agreed to take on the project. He made it clear that this was a big deal. The boss emphasized that this was an all-hands-on-deck situation involving nights and weekends. He explained that it was for a new client and they really wanted to impress them. I nodded along, already formulating a plan in my head. A couple of days before the project was set to begin, I got another call from him. The boss called to inform me that the engagement paperwork was on its way and told me to check my email. I responded by telling him that I had decided not to work on the project after all. There was a moment of silence on the other end of the line. Then the boss exploded, yelling that I had agreed to work on this project weeks ago. I smiled as I repeated his words back to him, saying that he should have gotten it in writing. The explosion that followed was something to behold. He screamed, he threatened, he pleaded. But I stood my ground. As he ranted, I calmly explained my position. I told him that he had taught me a lesson with those breakfast tacos. I pointed out that verbal agreements didn't mean anything to him, so why should they mean anything to me? I explained that I was just following his example. The boss protested, insisting that this situation was completely different. He stressed that they had a new client and needed all hands on deck, pleading that I couldn't do this to them. I apologized for the position he was in, but suggested that maybe next time he'd think twice before going back on his word. With that, I hung up the phone. I knew I might be burning a bridge, but some bridges aren't worth keeping. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.